Yeah. All right, amino acids, proteins, and enzymes. We're going to talk about amino acids and proteins. We will not get to enzymes today. We'll finish this up on Monday. How's that? Okay. Proteins and amino acids. Where do you find protein? Steak. Muscles, right? That's not the only places, though, right? These horns of these animals are made out of, of, these cows are made out of protein. Proteins are found in your fingernails, found in your cartilage, your muscle, in your hair. Proteins make up enzymes. Proteins are, enzymes are proteins. Proteins are polymers of amino acids with at least 20 different amino acids. They function as enzymes, regulating lots of basically every reaction in your body. They also make up certain molecules like hemoglobin and myoglobin, which transport oxygen. So they are structural. They are contractile, which means they make movement. They are important in transport. They're important in storage of some nutrients. They're important as hormones for some things. They're enzymes, and they're good for protection. So. Let's start with the basics for proteins. Amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, okay? They have a central carbon atom called an alpha carbon atom. And on the alpha carbon atom are two groups, an amine group and a carboxylate group, carboxylic acid. So it's both an amine and a carboxylic acid on that same carbon. And what differs is the other stuff that's attached to that carbon. So let's look at these two right here. We have valine and asparagine. Look at these two. The carbon in the blue. Look at the carbon in the blue. It has an NH3, an ammonium group or amine group on it. And it also has that COO minus. That's a carboxylic acid on it. Okay? So all amino acids have that. What's different is what's in yellow up there. Okay? You will hear people refer to amino acids as nonpolar or polar. They're polar or nonpolar based upon what that group is up there. This over here is a nonpolar group. On the right hand side is an amide group, and that is polar. Okay? So that's one of the ways you can classify amino acids. Um, nonpolar when the R group is hydrogen alkyl or aromatic and these are the polar I'm not going to worry about all these names if you're going to take a biochemistry course you'll have to learn all the amino acids we're not going to worry about that here are the polar amino acids they have polar groups on them yay now the fourth component that R group is what determines which amino acid you have those different amino acids are given abbreviations a three-letter abbreviation normally. Okay. This is aspartic acid. It's given the abbreviation ASP. And that's asparagine, ASN. Okay. Don't worry about the DNN stand for it. Okay. The three-letter designation, it just makes it easier as opposed to having to write the name out all the time. Amino acids can either be acidic or basic or neutral. There are only a couple of acidic amino acids. These two have carboxylic acids on them, aspartic acid and glutamic acid. These three are basic. They have amine groups on them. The amine acts as a proton acceptor. Histidine, lysine, and arginine. I'm not going to worry about you knowing which ones are which. I'm not going to worry about you drawing them. Now, the thing about these amino acids is that carbon that's in the middle is chiral. And they can be right and left-handed, like L-alanine and D-alanine. Okay? They're always chiral. That's why if you go look at, excuse me, your vitamin bottle, you will see there's some of them have amino acids in them, essential amino acids, and you'll see that some of them are L and D. About these. Okay. There are 11 of the 20 amino acids that your body can synthesize itself, makes it from nothing. 
nine amino acids are essential amino acids. They must be obtained from your diet. Anybody in here vegetarian or vegan? Are you, are you vegan? Vegetarian, what kinds of protein do you eat? Beans and soy products. Soy products is a bean product, right? It comes from soybeans. Yeah. You don't eat any fish or no dairy. You eat any dairy products? A little bit of dairy. So you're not a pure vegan. You're pretty close, so that's all you eat. Does anybody know the difference between vegetarian and vegan? Vegan doesn't do dairy or. Vegan doesn't do any, any animal products, nothing, right? No dairy, no cheese, no milk. They only eat plant products. I got somebody in my other class who says he's vegan. Like, my brother was vegan for 12 years and then he ate a steak. And he was happy. His diet, uh, his doctor said so he had to change his diet. Steak makes people happy, right? <laughs> <laughs> makes me happy. I love the taste of meat. I mean, I, I just, that's. I don't have anything against people who are vegan, but I just like the taste of meat, so I don't I could never be a vegan. There's just no way. I mean, I like the taste of vegetables. I love vegetables like broccoli, probably I'd eat it all day long, but God, I had a steak or a big old pork chop to go with my broccoli, right? Okay. So if you're vegan or, or even strict vegetarians, have to be very careful. If y'all hear what she eats, she eats a lot of beans, soybeans, legumes contain a lot of these amino acids that are essential for you. Because if you don't, then it's, yeah, your body doesn't function right, okay? So, most people eat meat, and so they don't have to worry about, as long as you eat a well-balanced diet, you get a plenty of amino acids in your body, because they, you get them from the, from the muscle tissue of the meat that you're eating, right? Meat, everybody knows that when you eat a steak, what you're eating is the muscle of the cow, right? When you eat a piece of fish, you're eating the muscle of the fish. When you eat a pork chop, you're eating the muscle of the pig. Sounds kind of disgusting now, we doesn't it? Sure tastes good though, doesn't it? Oh, we're not going to worry about acids and bases and isoelectric points. How's that? Boom, 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 boom. We do want to talk about structures of Protein center. Okay, there's four levels of structure to a protein. And we're going to talk about each one of them a little bit. And then we'll be done for today. The first level is called the primary structure. Okay? And that is when you link two amino acids together by a peptide bond. So it's a covalent bond linking two amino acids together and you have now joined two amino acids together. When you join a bunch of them together, you join enough of them together, you make a protein. The sequence in which they occur is the primary structure of a protein. How do they know what sequence to put them in? Your body, how does your body know which sequence to put the amino acids? Who's had biology class? Who had bio 110? Anybody take bio 110? Who took biology in high school? Did you learn anything about how your cells work? How do you make proteins? Who's responsible for making proteins in your cells? About a moment. Ribosomes. And what do ribosomes have? RNA? Yeah. Ah. Ribonucleic acid. Yeah. Ribonucleic acid, right? Um, and that RNA determines when it bonds to the amino acids, it determines when the amino acids bond to the RNA in the right sequence, that tells it what sequence to put the amino acids in, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like this one is allylucismet. Alanine, leucine, cysteine, methionine. It's only 
four, right? That's a tetraamino acid. Okay. Allaleucis met's easier to say than. Holy moly! I ain't gonna try. <laughs> so proteins are polypeptides. They have at least twenty, some most of the time fifty or more amino acids in the right sequence, and they're biologically active. The primary structure of a protein is the sequence in which these amino acids appear. Okay, because if you change that sequence, you change the protein. Okay. Now, they don't have to appear one after. You can have two alanines, or you could have three leucines, or whatever. You can repeat, right? You don't just use each one of them once, and then you can't use it again. So there's an infinite combination possible, okay? Yeah. Insulin. Insulin is a protein. And it was the first one to have its primary structure determined. So what sequence do these amino acids appear at? It has a primary structure with two chains beside each other. And those two chains are joined with disulfide bonds. Okay? If you put those amino acids in the wrong place, those sulfur groups won't line up and it won't bond together. Then you won't have insulin. You have to have it in the right sequence in order to, for it to bond together and to make insulin. One of those chains has 21 amino acids and the other one has 30, so it has 51 amino acids in the right sequence. Okay. Yeah, we don't care about that. Now, secondary structures, tertiary and quaternary structures. The shape on the right is a spiral staircase. That is analogous to an alpha helix in a an alpha helix is a spiral. So once you get your amino acids together in the right sequence, then it's, it might start to coil like that does and twist. The direction of the twist depends upon L versus D, doesn't it? Okay. So that's a secondary structure for a protein, the coil, the alpha helix, secondary structure. So here we have the alpha helix, and you can see that they have all the stick and ball model. I'm looking at the ribbon over there, and you can see how the ribbon is twisting as it goes up, right? So the amino acids are in the right sequence, and as it goes up, it rotates. That's called an alpha helix, okay? And that alpha helix is held together because some of those amino acids are attracted to the ones that are beneath them in the alpha helix. Another type of secondary structure is called a beta pleated protein or a beta pleated sheet. The beta pleated sheet looks like a fat, flat piece of paper that's been folded into pleats. Okay? And the way it's held together is by hydrogen atoms on one carbonyl group, oxygen, holding to but being attracted to the hydrogens on a nitrogen group and another amino acid. And it looks like that. It looks like a beta pleated sheet. Another secondary structure is a woven structure. It is a triple helix. Here we have three polypeptide chains. They're all twisted together or woven. Either twisting or weaving results in very strong protein chains. Anybody ever braided your hair, mm -hmm. I could probably pick you up by that, huh? If I tried to pick you up by one strand of hair, it wouldn't work too good, would it? No, you just pull my hair out. It'd probably break, right? Or pull it out. But if I braid your hair together, like these braided proteins, what happens? It makes it really strong, and that's why this is the type of um, secondary structure you see in collagen, connective tissue, skin, tendons, and cartilage. Okay? Are these twisted or woven helixes, okay? So you have the alpha helix that's in either twisted or woven together like this. The tertiary structure then of a protein is the overall three-dimensional shape once you get this secondary shape. So you might have an alpha helix, a twist, or a beta pleated, and then those pleats or those twists then come together to make a tertiary structure. 
So first is the order, second is alpha helix, twist, or beta pleated. Tertiary then is how to bring those things together. And when I bring those twists and pleats together, I can do all kinds of stuff, right? These are different chains of amino acids being brought together. Different sections have alpha helix and some are beta pleated. And we can join all those together or how do we join them together? By ionic attractions called a salt bridge or hydrogen bonding, attraction between hydrogen and oxygen. Or there might even be hydrophobic repulsions there that are keeping things from being together. These tertiary structures are held together with all these different types of interactions. Hydrophobic, hydrophilic, salt bridges, which are ionic attractions, and hydrogen bonds, which are hydrogens attracted to oxygen and nitrogen on another amino acid. So all these things act together to form the tertiary structure. Globular proteins are exactly what they say. They are big lumps of protein. They look like globs, right? However, this one is important in transporting oxygen in your blood. This is myoglobin and hemoglobin together. They store oxygen in your body. They are spiral structure ribbons, so they are alpha helixes. They're then put together in a big globule like this, okay? Now, it's not just random. I know it looks random, but it is not random at all, okay? It only fits together in one way. It's like a very complex puzzle. Fibrous proteins consist of long fiber-like shapes. So they take the twist, and then you braid that twist together again, and you can make things like the hair on this sheep, right? Which we would call wool and in the wool we can spin, right? So. The quaternary structure then is when you take these funky looking things and then you put several of them together. That now is starting to look like hemoglobin, okay? These ribbon structures were together in a tertiary structure and now they're together in a quaternary structure. So it's like we put four of them together to make these things. This particular one is made up of four sub-polypeptide units. And on Monday, we'll talk about enzymes and we will review. You guys have to bring questions to review. If you don't bring any questions, I don't answer anything, we just go home. You bring questions, I'll answer whatever you bring, okay? Fair enough? Okay, see you guys Monday.